You might have heard about some insanely large amounts of money stolen from crypto projects. We see all kinds of attacks, some that entirely wreck a project and it's nowhere to be heard of again. Some get covered by the venture capitalists that back it up, and some just apologize, fix their code and carry on. But did you ever wonder, how exactly did they pull it off? How much of a professional hacker do you need to be in order to extract so much money out of crypto without waiting for next bull run or Elon Musk tweeting about doggy coins? In this video, I'm going to explain how hackers are able to find these exploits and get away with it. But before I jump into the video, like, comment and give a sub to hack the algo. So you might have stumbled upon an article telling you that millions of dollars were lost in a project you never heard of, or a tweet from some anon with a colorful profile picture laying out his own postmortem with detailed code snippets about how exactly another Anon managed to steal millions of dollars. Only recently we saw Axie Infinity, the metaverse NFT card battle game, wrecked for around $624 million. And another project called Inverse Finance flipped for $15 million. And that's not even the tip of the iceberg. The truth is, these events happen on a daily basis. And if you start exploring, you will hit a point where you either see there is a real problem in the crypto space right now with security measures, or you think for yourself, hey, I'm a smart fella, I can do it too. But wait, so many questions arise. How in the first place there are so many projects with so much money in them? Why didn't I hear about them in the first place? How is it even possible that there is so much money invested in these projects but only a few degenerate programmers follow their Twitter account? Let me explain. In order for you to become a certified Ethereum lead hacker, you need to learn and master these three easy steps. How smart contract programming works how to exploit them, and how to get away with it. It's easy, really. Let's take a look at some recent examples in order to better understand how these individuals do it. But before that, a small disclaimer. I'm of course not enticing anybody for doing any illegal activity, but simply exploring these exploits for our collective intellectual entertainment. So please, don't glow on me. Exhibit A, Axie Infinity and the Ronin Network. This is a big one, folks. A baffling $624 million drained from the Ronin network, which is an Ethereum sidechain with like 9 active validators, which essentially renders it centralized. If you don't know what a validator is, it's a node program that checks the validity of the transaction try to get added into the blockchain. The whole idea of a blockchain is having a big network that consists of many orthogonal validators, which ensures that the chain is actually decentralized. However, in Ronin's case, they only had 9 validators. For reference, the new Ethereum beacon chain, which is an upcoming upgrade to the main chain, already has more than 300,000 validators and it's not even fully operational yet and the Ethereum development team is taking its time before merging. So it's baffling to me how a blockchain based project could convince people to take a part in it with such a centralized system backing it up. The reason they did this is because Ethereum is not cheap. I get it. However, giving up security and decentralization to get more speed and lower transaction costs is a no-no. Might as well not be a blockchain-based game in that case. But we pay for our mistakes. If you have 9 operational validators, it only takes 5 of them to cooperate and change the state. And it just happens to be that 4 of these validators are operated by Sky Mavis, the company behind Axie Infinity and Ronin. So in case of a security breach, you only need one additional compromised validator to do whatever you want on Ronin. Sky Mavis did not make an official statement on how the explorer got his answer to validators, as far as I know, but it seems he was able to get the fifth one through the Axie DAO. After he got all five validators at his mercy, the attacker authorized two transactions for himself, first with 173,000 ETH, which is around $600 million, and another one with 25,000 USDC. In total, he got around $625 million for himself. We'll explain how he was able to launder some of it later. Exhibit B, Inverse Finance. This is a complicated one folks, but let's try to unpack the core of the exploit. This one was done by a professional. Inverse Finance aims to maximize your earnings via revenue sharing, accumulate high yields with sustainable APYs and benefit from low cost stable coin borrowing. Positive sum DeFi they call it. It all started when the exploiter withdrew 901 ETH from Tornado Cash. We will get to what exactly is Tornado Cash later. It's important. Having a large sum of ETH, by swapping some of it to ENV on SushiSwap, Inverse Finance's token, he was able to manipulate the price in favor of ENV and inflate it higher. At the same time, he began spamming transactions with an exploit to be the first to get into the next block and get an inflated price on SushiSwap. The pair was using SushiSwap's TWAP as a price oracle, which got manipulated in favor of ENV and got incredibly expensive. 
In case you don't know how price circles work in automated market makers, the basic idea is in order to determine the price of the tokens inside a pool, the contract calculates the time weighted average price, or TWAP in short. The pool's contract essentially averages the price on a number of older blocks and gives the result. Increased periods of measurement, or more blocks in other words, results in a less up-to-date price. This is a fairly reliable way to determine the price on a decentralized AMM, but it tends to be quite manipulatable when large sums of money are traded. The security of a pool or a pair goes up with the amount of reserves in the pool. More reserves in the AMM means more security, in the sense that the pool is less prone to price manipulation. Think of it this way, if you had a scale with small amount of stones on each side, it is fairly easy to temper with the balance, since the overall weight is low and taking a stone from one side to the other side will have a relatively higher effect on the balance. However, if you add a larger amount of stones on each side, it's much more difficult to temper with the balance. An AMM based pool is kind of the same. The price is determined by the ratio of the reserves in the pool. More reserves mean more security in terms of influence on price manipulation. The hacker knew this in an case case that had a fairly low reserve AMM. Therefore, adding a large sum of ETH and taking the equivalent of INV will heavily manipulate the price. As a result, the attacker was able to withdraw $50 million worth of a set of cryptocurrencies currencies with a flurry of transactions and a few more complex borrowings. Exhibit C Poly Network This was a big one last year, amassing $611 million at that time on three different chains, Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain and Polygon. Poly Network is a cross-chain protocol that aims to provide infrastructure for Web 3.0 development by integrating over 15 blockchains and enabling cross-chain asset transfers. Now, in case you don't know how function selectors work in Solidity-based smart contracts, here's a quick explanation. When the user sends a transaction to a smart contract, it includes input data within the message. The contract takes this input and looks at the first four bytes and checks if it has a function that corresponds to these four bytes. How do Solidity compilers couple function with these four bytes? It's really simple. It uses the Kachuk 256 hashing algo when compiling the contract code and inserts all of the function names with the arguments surrounded with brackets and commas. In simpler words, it just reads the function written in it in a shortened version, takes the hash of the string and then uses only the first four bytes as the function selector. That way, when a call comes into the contract, it checks these four bytes and attempts to match the desired user data to its own functions. This process is called function input decoding. While this process is pretty efficient, it has one major unexploitable flaw. Since the decoder only looks at the first four bytes of the hash, it is not impossible to find a different Solidity example of function string that after inputting into Kachuk 256 and taking the first four bytes, will output the same four bytes as another string. For example, the most basic function is a transfer function. This one has at least three more function strings that after encoding them result in the same leading four bytes, although the complete hashes are different. Poly had a cross-chain manager smart contract with some privileges to it for managing messages between chains. One of its functions had an execute cross-chain transaction command inside of it with multiple guards around this command in order to not allow anyone to just send cross-chain transactions. But one safeguard the developers forgot to add is to prevent the contract from calling another one of their contracts. Basically, all the attacker had to figure out was the right SIGASH. This will trigger a series of events that would lead Poly's ecosystem of contract to send money into his wallet. He didn't need the full hash collision, only the first 4 bytes. By triggering the contract with a well-crafted fake function, he was able to steal more than $600 million on three different chains. You gotta admit, it's quite amazing how much money can be extracted by understanding math and cryptography. As we showed, there are a couple of ways to breach a blockchain-based system. You either compromise it by exploiting its centralized aspects, manipulate it for your favor, usually in terms of price, or outright exploit a code vulnerability in the online smart contract. But one question remains unanswered. How can you get away with it? Sure, you can be a smartass and figure out ways to exploit projects for millions of dollars, but now there is a huge amount of money just sitting in your wallets and everybody's following your addresses for any sort of movement, since it's all public data. Essentially, you cannot cash out in a traditional way. Or do you? 
When you take a closer look at hackers' wallets, most of them interact with one specific system before and after a hack. This system is called Tornado Cash. But what exactly is Tornado Cash? Tornado Cash is a fully decentralized non-custodial protocol allowing private transactions in the crypto space. It has two directions, deposit and withdraw. In order for the Tornado contract to process a deposit, Tornado generates a random area of bytes, computes it with a specific hash function called Perison hash, since ZK Snarks works well with it, and then deposits the tokens inside the contract with the hash and stores it in the Merkle tree, which is a computational tree of hashes. If you want to process the other direction, the withdrawal, no matter if you use the wallet you use for the deposit, you only need a few bytes of the original bytes you received at the time of the deposit. This part is public data, but it can be matched one to one to the full bytes you got at the beginning of the process. This is possible through some magic math around ZK Snarks and how they operate. In simpler words, when you deposit you get a password and you can then use parts of it later when you pull out. It doesn't matter whether you are coming from the same depositing wallet or not. But there is something missing and the smart ones watching this might have picked it up. If I input a very specific amount of tokens or ether and after 10 minutes withdraw the same amount, it is easily traceable. But the tornado architects are smart, so they let only a very specific amount in and out. You cannot input any amount you desire. For ethereum for example, you can only deposit or withdraw 0 0.1, 1, 10 or 100 ETH at a given transaction. This mechanism helps disguise users because if everybody deposits and withdraws the same amounts, it is nearly impossible to discern between one user and another. Nevertheless, Tornado is a fascinating system and is pretty effective at what it does. I highly suggest you read more about the mechanics behind Tornado in particular and zero knowledge proofs in general. To sum up my point, there is no point. I just like rambling about cool crypto stuff and it fascinates me that one can use math skills to troll venture capital money. Anyway, make sure to like, comment and give a sub to hack the algo. Cheers.